coming up on episode 20 of Create It Friday. There's so much noise now that it takes much more work to stand out. I think numbers on a list or followers are vanity metrics. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. People don't realize that they can cultivate an audience of people that they want to have in their audience. One by one the stars are disappearing from the horizon. Welcome to episode 20 of the Creative Writing Podcast. I've made it to 20 episodes. I don't know why that feels like kind of a big deal, but here we are. So this week, I'm super excited to bring you a conversation with Paul Jarvis. And I say a conversation because I didn't send him questions. So here's how I do interviews. I like to talk with people either about what I'm really interested in about them or what they're really interested in at the moment, because I feel like if you're passionate about something, it carries through in the conversation. And I would rather if somebody is like, I'm super excited about Twitter, I'd rather talk to them about that then make them talk about whatever I want. So anyway, I had emailed Paul and said, hey, I could talk to you about 80 things. What do you want to talk about? And so he wanted to talk about the Sunday Dispatch, which is his weekly email. And you guys know I'm a big nerdy email person. So that's what we talked about. But I forgot to send him questions after asking that. So we just did a sort of off the cuff question and answer. And it blew my mind just a little bit. And it might blow yours too. So Paul Jarvis is I guess he would call himself ultimately a freelancer. He kind of describes himself in the interview because it's hard to do. He's been doing web design for years and he does a lot of writing in different places. And he talks about how his weekly email gets interspersed and kind of connected with his blog posts and posting other places. So that's something to look forward to, to see how he handles that. But I got to know Paul through um, seeing him in an interview with Blaine Hogan, who was the first interview I did on this show, actually. And and as a part of Blaine's course, he interviewed Paul, and then I signed up for the Sunday Dispatch, and I've been getting those. And Paul was one of those people where if you hit reply, he responds. Now, I hate to say that because now don't flood Paul with your responses, because as he says, sometimes he gets 200 every week. I know, right? We should all be so lucky, except, you know, that's a lot of emails to answer. So, Anyway, I'm really excited about about this talk with Paul. He is very knowledgeable in all things internet and working for yourself and creating content and being really genuine. And that's what I love about Paul is that he's just who he is. And we talk about that as well. So I'm going to stop kind of saying all these things so that you can actually just hear them for yourself in the interview. But before we get there, I did want to say that The next month in November, I am going to be doing something a little different, and I'm not sure exactly how this is going to look, but I'm going to do NaNoWriMo, which is, I I hate even saying that, most people call it NaNo, so I'm going to do that, but it's National Novel Writing Month, and this takes place every year in November. I'm not even sure how long it's been going on, but people all over the world take the month of November and they sign up and write a novel, 50,000 words in that month. Now, it's a first draft of a novel, so it's not like you come out and then you're like, now line up the agents so I can send my book out. But it's uh, the goal is to get 50,000 words, and you can actually do, there's like a word counting tool so that you can make it official. Um, You don't have to share your work so everybody sees it, but you plug it into this little word counter that's on the website. Anyway, it's kind of fun, and I met up this week with a nano group right here, kind of on the west side of Houston, where I live, and that was really fun because... I never talk to writers in real life. It's always over the internet somehow. And so anyway, that was a really fun time getting to meet them. And so I think I'm going to do some nano themed stuff in November because I'm going to be hard at work writing 50,000 words of a novel somehow in between the other things I'm doing. So that does mean less interviews because the interviews take probably about double the time of the normal podcast episodes. So we're going to be doing no interviews in the month of November unless unless something changes, that's the plan. And I might be doing some sort of novel writing tools, inspiration, that kind of thing. So I would love to connect with any of you nanoers out there. You'll have to hit me up on Twitter. I'm at Kiki Mojo or find me on the createifwriting.com blog. So this episode will be at createifwriting.com slash zero two zero for episode 20. So I'm going to go ahead and dive right in with this interview with Paul. Welcome today to the Creative Writing Podcast, Paul Jarvis. I'm so excited to get to talk to you today. Hey, I'm excited as well. 
if I'm ever talking about you or mentioning, you know, your work, I kind of don't know how to describe what you do. And so like, I'm just going to let you do that and tell us kind of who you are and what, what you would consider your work. I was going to say join the club because I don't know how to describe <laughs> what I do either. Yeah. So basically I do a whole bunch of things. Like I've done, I've been a freelance web designer for almost two decades I've written a bunch of best-selling books. I run a couple courses, for one for freelancers, one for writers. I have two podcasts and a whole bunch of other random digital products. But basically, the, the gist of all of that crap that I do is really just <laughs> to help freelancers and more specifically creative freelancers get better at the business and sales and marketing side of things. So using their craft to get more clients that are the right fit, make more money, that sort of thing. I call myself a freelance evangelist right awesome. now because it, it sounds fancy <laughs> and I, I want to be fancy. So um, You don't strike me as super fancy. Don't take that the wrong way. <laughs> I'm so, no, I'm so not fancy at all, but it's it seems nice to be to be fancy or thought of as fancy. Well, I like, well then sorry, I didn't think of you that way. <laughs> um, that's okay. That's okay. I do like when people kind of make up these titles for themselves. Like Nikki Elledge Brown, she has a course about copy. And she mm -hmm. has named herself the communication stylist and has like nice. trademarked that. And it's awesome. And she's fantastic. I really like her. But yeah, I mean, the freelance evangelist, I feel like that needs to be a book or course or t-shirt. I mean, at the least a t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, so I came to find you through a course from Blaine Hogan called Make Better. And he did an interview with you. And it's funny because I don't actually remember what you guys talked about. I'm sure it was like life-changing, but I don't actually remember at the time. But I do know that as, as a result of that, I went ahead and subscribed to your newsletter. And so um, I have been getting the Sunday Dispatch for, I don't know, I guess a year. Nice. And, and it's fun because it it's one of the emails that I look forward to getting. And, you know, these days in this age that we're in, it's rare when you look forward to getting an email. I really enjoy it. and I But I don't know if I can explain exactly why, because it's different every week. Like, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to get, which maybe is part of the fun. Like, it's like, ooh, what's Paul going to send this week? And then for a while, I kind of felt like you might think I was a crazy stalker because I actually responded to your emails and you responded back, which I always love when people do that. Um, <laughs> but I have to kind of like restrain myself because if you respond to like every person's email, every time they send it, it gets to be a little, you know, weird, right? Yeah, well, it's also hard because it, there's only so many hours in the day. And I'm, I'm lucky that the subscribers that I have are so engaged and excited and stoked for the things I do. But it's, I can't respond to 500 emails on Sunday kind of thing. But I, I try to reply to a lot of them or I try to just like thank the person and then click archive <laughs> kind of thing. Because there's like I just I wouldn't have enough time to write more articles if I was just replying to people who are emailing me about the articles. I love when people do that, but I can only reply to some. Not well, now, all. do you get, like you said, 500, but do you get like 500 replies to your emails? It's usually over 200 replies oh my every Sunday. Okay, yeah. so then let's talk about that. <laughs> so you send a weekly email and it's the Sunday Dispatch. So tell me how that came to be. Sure. So really, that was just, it kind of evolved into what I wanted. Um, a mailing list to be like if I was on a mailing list, I would want what I do because at the time, this was probably about three years ago, all of the newsletters that I were subscribed to were completely self serving to the creator. And I was like, as an audience member, I don't give a shit like hmm. that you're selling something at me every single week or telling me something that just relates to you every single week. And I was like, why, why am I here? Like, you could just do these things and I don't have to pay attention because I'm not getting any value whatsoever. So I was like, what if I just start blogging on, like, my newsletter instead? Because people like, like I like to read other people's articles because I love to read, love to write. I was like, what if I just put my articles in email form and send those out to people so they would get those before they're on my site or through the um, like syndication, uh, syndication through publications, that sort of thing. So I just started doing that. And at the time, it wasn't really, like I don't think anybody else was doing that. I think Chris Brogan was probably doing it. I probably stole the idea from Chris Brogan. But so, yeah, I was just like, I just want to send people articles that they will hopefully find interesting. Hmm. And I kind of stuck with it. And I've been doing and being consistent about it. So I do it every single week without 
break, except for I typically take a sabbatical from the internet from around American Thanksgiving to the New Year because nobody's paying attention then anyways. It's all Christmas crap and everybody's marketing <laughs> and advertising. So I just don't care. I just leave. But uh, other than that, every Sunday, I'm super, super strict about being consistent with it. I send a new article. And like you said, you don't know what's going to come out. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to write about sometimes. Like sometimes there's weird articles about unicorns. I think next week, which will be after this airs, is an article about playgrounds and jungle gyms. Awesome. But it relates to the, my like, more overall message and stuff. So yeah, I just try to be interesting and valuable to my audience. And that's really, <laughs> that's the long and short of the strategy is being interesting and being valuable. Well, I love that. And, you know, I like the idea of, you know, interesting and valuable. And and again, it seems really like obvious, like, of course, you would send people interesting, valuable stuff, but that's not really what most people send. No, they send stuff that's interesting and valuable to themselves, <laughs> not yes. to their audience. Well, so okay, so how do you distinguish then? Because I hope that they would align in some ways what's interesting to both of us. But how Definitely. do you like kind of shift that writing and that focus to be what's interesting and valuable to your people? Yeah. So the way that I do that is I split it basically. I look at, I do this radical thing called listening <laughs> to what? my audience. What is so this? So weird. I know. It's weird, especially since I'm a guy. But so I listen to kind of what topics my audience are talking about, interested in, struggling with. And that's interesting to them and valuable to them. And then to make it interesting and valuable to me, I put my own spin on it. So I have like dirty potty humor brain. So the things that I write about, I write about topics that are interesting and valuable to my audience, but in a way that's interesting and typically funny to me. So that's why there's like business articles about unicorn farts or that sort of thing. Yeah. So I keep it interesting. But I also think that that keeps it interesting to my audience. Like I always have some weird way of getting to the point that I'm trying to make that's very me. Otherwise, I get bored. And I think otherwise my audience would get bored. Like there's no shortage of business and marketing and and like internet articles and content out there. But I think why people read my stuff is because it's about the same topics, but it's my own unique voice and lens and like personal brand, I guess, that makes it uh, slightly off center. Well, and they know it's you too. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's very clear. And I feel like we should be distinguishable, right? Like, mm -hmm. or else I don't want to be subscribed. You know, I want to have that kind of feeling. And your actual, your email this week, um, it was all about how you have pretty much like kind of pissed people off sometimes with your, the way you talk about things and how in that exact lens that you were saying that you use, you know, when you're writing and you're seeing these things. So I, I kind of love that because I think, first of all, it gets you closer and quicker to your ideal client. Like I think when people are afraid of, pissing people off, you're being too middle of the road and you might actually really miss those targeted people who would love you for you. You know, so when you are really targeted like you are, like I'm just going to be me and I'm going to give this great advice, but package it like this, you're going to weed out all the people you don't need and who don't want your services, which is yeah, nice. I use, I use humor for that. Like, cause I don't want an audience of idiots and I find that stupid people have a hard time with humor. So <laughs> I use humor a lot because I only want – it's fun. people don't realize that they can cultivate an audience of people that they want to have in their audience. Like it's a two-way street. Like if I don't want somebody in my audience, then I'm, it's okay if they're not in my audience. I can, I can kind of draw a line in the sand. So I use things like – because that's who I am. Like I'm a silly, like random, non sequitur kind of guy. And in real life, the amount of swearing and bad jokes is way, way more. But it's still <laughs> like it would take more work for me to not put that stuff in my writing than it would otherwise, right? So I just, I don't know. I like to cultivate the exact type of people that I want in my audience and then everybody else I just don't care about. And so using things like that, like humor and weird, weird references to things is how I build an audience of people. Like when I talk to people in my audience, I like to talk to them. Like I'm interested in them. They're good people. And it wouldn't be that way if I wasn't so conscious and picky of how I differentiate who should be part of my audience and who shouldn't be part of my audience. 
And as creators and as people who are building their brands, you can do that. Like you can pick <laughs> who, what kind of person you want in your audience and what kind of person you don't. I love this because I think, you know, the internet right now, like I just keep running across because of, you know, what I'm interested in. I keep running across the the blogs and the sites and the ads for like, build your 10,000, you know, person email list like this month, you know, or <laughs> like those <laughs> wonderful promises. And I, I don't, there's nothing, I don't mean to knock a big list. I don't mean to knock like those people's efforts and the great advice, because I like to look at that advice and then do what works for me out of it. But the issue with that is that everybody's looking at how to grow a list, but they're not looking at like, what you were talking about, like what kind of list, like, sure, you could try to grow like a, you know, 1000 or 10,000 person email list like this month. But who's going to be on it? Like if you if you really, I mean, I don't know, it depends who you are, maybe. But if you're really able to do that, are you doing it? The, like, are you cultivating that group that you want? Or are you just getting like a whole bunch of people who are never going to open your email? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I could, if you want to build a 10,000 person list, give away $10,000 worth of Apple products, to, in order to get signups, and you'll grow a 10,000 person list. It, it's just going to be all shitty people on that list. Yeah. But like, it's easy to do. My friend Jason Zook had uh, 25,000 people on his list for his old company, the I Wear Your Shirt business. And they weren't the audience that he wanted to serve anymore. He deleted that list in MailChimp. And it was wow. like, he was probably sweating a little when he hit delete, but he was like, as soon as I hit delete, I felt free. And that was 25,000 people that he had had on his list that. He could have kept emailing, but like they weren't opening, they weren't they weren't engaging because they weren't the right his what he does shifted, so his audience shifted a bit. And even for myself, like I delete people. I think numbers on a list or followers are vanity metrics. Like they're good for like bumping up your ego a bit, or possibly good for selling ads, but it they don't it means absolutely nothing. Like I think engagement is really what actually matters. So I would rather have a list of a thousand people that are super engaged, super interested, find value in the stuff that I do than 10,000 people that just don't give a shit that are just there because I gave them like an iPad or something. Like I've never do that. But like, <laughs> so it's just, it's these numbers are vanity metrics completely. And they mean absolutely nothing other than making some people feel good about themselves. But it's the engagement and it's the uh, like, are they willing to support you financially or even just like with encouragement and that sort of thing? I think that's what's way more important. And it's hard to really measure that specifically other than looking at, I guess, like some things like open rates and click through rates. Well, I have two questions kind of stemming from what you just said. And but first, I have to suggest I feel like even if just as sort of like a re reaction, like I would love to see you start a course of like how to get people off your email list. <laughs> I just think that would be. I would take it like I would, <laughs> I would totally take that just because I think in some ways the ideas you're saying of like driving the people off that don't belong there or deleting things like it's actually, you know, if somebody took that course, they'd actually have an awesome list by the end. How you to know? remove your first 1K. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like even just out of curiosity, there'd be some people who'd be like, yeah, I'm there. I'm down. I've deleted over 7,000 people from my mailing list. Oh, like gosh. Over the last two years, I've deleted 7,000 people from my list. These, it's just kind of making me shake a little inside. So, <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. This is, this is good. This is taking me out of like my comfort zone. So tell me, okay, this is the question that relates to that as well. I want to know about list management then. So what do you do to like get people off? You drive people away with your awesome humor, which is great. Yes. And then what else do you do? Do you delete unopens? Do you reach out to those people? Tell me about how you manage that. Yeah. So, well, the one thing that I do is if somebody sends me an email that's like rude or disrespectful, I scroll down to the bottom and click on subscribe and that takes them off my list. Like they've replied to my newsletter. So I click on subscribe on the email that they just sent me and it takes them off my list because I don't want, like if somebody's going to say something mean, they're done. But then the other thing that I do for list management is I look at typically um, once a quarter, I look at how many people have received, say, like the last 20 emails and not opened or clicked any of those? Mm. And then I just delete them. Because there are a lot of false positives there. Like with Gmail, it doesn't display um, images by default sometimes. So, And that's how things like um, mailing list software sees if you're an opener because it loads an invisible pixel in that. And then that shows that that pixel was loaded. So there are sometimes false positives. So I always make sure at least once a quarter, there's something 
where there's an image that's worth opening or there's a link that's worth clicking because that's another way that um, software sees if the newsletter has been opened is if somebody clicked from it because every URL in every email is generated um, as a unique has a unique variable attached to the the back of it. So typically, I do that and I delete. Yeah, thousands of people at a time sometimes based on that. Like if they've been on my list for 20 campaigns and they haven't opened any of those 20 campaigns, then I could send them an email (laughs) saying like, hey, if you want to stay on the list, click here or something. I'm just like, fuck, I don't care. If they (laughs) don't want to be there, then I'm going to delete them. If they notice, they can reach out. I could tell them why. They can resubscribe, something like that. But I don't even tell them. I just nuke them. List management. (laughs) There you go. I've I've started doing... Because I, th- I think this is the other thing, like people really, they want those vanity metrics and everybody, because everybody's talking about having the 10,000 person or the 1,000 person or the whatever list, everybody feels like they need to do that. And they feel like all lists mm-hmm. are equal, like equally easy to build, I guess. And that's just not true either. Um, but uh, most people are afraid. They're afraid to unsubscribe people. Or they're afraid to um, look back, you know, who hasn't opened, like, it's like, I'm going to send it out. And I'm scared. And I don't know who's going but I'm just going to like, boom, there it goes. Okay, I'm not gonna think about it. Like, I think we don't treat our email list the way we treat our blogs, I would say. Yeah, where people will look at their stats endlessly and look at Google Analytics endlessly, because I'm in all these blogger groups, since I hear people doing this. And then our email list, it's like, Oh, yeah, I have one. It's like an RSS or something. And that's kind of the attention that's paid to that you know, nothing deeper than that. But I really like to what I've started kind of doing is every couple months, like I will look at the people who haven't opened. And sometimes I'll do one, like people who've never opened and do something different for them. Mm -hmm. And I will send an email, but it's not like a nice like, hey, you can unsubscribe. Like I try to either like, get them like, oh, yeah, this is why I subscribed in the first place. Or like this chick is nuts. Goodbye. Like I'll send like a goofy photo or something that's, you know, like, my personality, but like a little bit on steroids, like I'm going to give them Mm -hmm. so much of this that they're either like, you're awesome. I love you or goodbye. And usually it's goodbye. And if they don't open that, then I delete them. (laughs) But, um, you know, I try something where it's like, it's definitely designed because I feel like this is my thinking. Unless I'm doing a bunch of giveaways and stuff, which I realized early on, like they, they just plump up your list with nothing. It's like, it's just nothing. But, um, you know, unless they got on there that way, at some point, they were interested in what I had to say, interested enough to go through the time to like subscribe, you know, and usually it takes a couple screens, you know, a couple things you have to click on, you have to go to your email, and then stuff pops up, and you have to deal with all those things. So if they were interested enough to go through the process, they might actually still be interested, you know, or not. So um, that's kind of how I handle it. But I, sometimes I just forget to, like, and then um, when my open rates get really bad, I'm like, I should probably delete like half these people because no one's, no one's looking. But yeah. um, and that's a that's a that's a good point though because like if I look at when I delete people, my open rates increase. So when you look at like the net net, I've deleted thousands of people, but the same number of people are still opening my emails. But I'm also getting charged less because I get charged hundreds of dollars a month from Mailchimp for my list. So and I'm cheap. So yeah. if I can delete some people who are not even opening my emails and I can save like 30, 40 bucks a month, especially since it's an American yeah. and the American dollar is worth a lot more than the Canadian dollar right now, then it's like, yeah, I might as well delete these people. Yeah, definitely. When you're paying for it, like I think when I talk to people who are at the beginning stages and they're using like the free mail champ or, you know, they're not really paying, yeah. it's like, oh, I don't care who opens. But once you get to that point where like, oh, I got to pay for these people, then it's sort of like, uh, let's let's get serious about this well yeah one other question i had kind of stemming from that then is i mean clearly like you have fun great content that's engaging but do you have any like special i'm not tr- tricks this one what are your special tricks for <laughs> <laughs> um what how do you get people to open and engage with your emails like do you have not special tricks but do you have any sort of methods that work for you or do you just like write stuff and you assume people might open or kind of what's behind and and keep in mind and I'm going to say this I wanted to put this in the interview somewhere I know that you're a person who tests things because there was a time mm-hmm. after watching a webinar with you I was like hey you know your photo doesn't really encapsulate who you are. And you're like, well, that's okay. I split tested it and this is effective. And I was like, you split tested your profile photo. So I know that about you, that you will split test even the photo that's on your blog. So how do you kind of deal with, you know, upping that engagement and increasing that or keeping it, you know, going on your list? 
Yeah, and with website split, te A-B testing is a little more difficult, but things like Optimizely um, make it fairly easy to do, or what's the other one? OWS, I think. But for email, I don't know about other platforms, but for MailChimp, it's really easy to split test, split test things. And typically what I split tests are the headlines, mm. because just like blog headlines, the the subject line is what's going to get people to open it or not. So I typically do like two headlines and I send it to 10% of my list and then the winner after two hours goes out to the next 90%. It's really easy to do. Like you just follow, you click a B campaign instead of regular old campaign. Yeah. And that's, and you just follow the steps. Like it's really simple. I also split tests and typically only once a year for this is, um, content that lives on the site versus content that lives just in the newsletter. So the whole article in the newsletter. And that, I haven't split test for a while because every time I ran that test, it just crushed in terms of people open it and read it and click more if all the content is in the email. So I know that about my audience. Like I don't really need to test that anymore. Headlines, I typically test every week. So if you get the e if you get my email at 6 a.m., then you're part of the 10% that I'm testing it against. And if you get it at like 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, then you're you're getting the winner of the test. So I think headlines are super important. And then I use that headline when I publish it on my site and syndicate it out. Because I know that headline, I tested it with a couple thousand people. I found which one was more likely to get open and clicked in. And then I use that on my blog and um, the other publications that I write for. I love that. Well, where else do you put up publications? Because I know, like, I've seen you different places, and I think you have some really good choices. They wouldn't be the right choices for everybody, but I like some of the choices. Mm -hmm. They're different than kind of some of the crowds I run with where they syndicate things. Yeah, right now, because I used to do a lot of guest writing, and now there's kind of a tipping point that I found, and a lot of people have found, where guest writing really helped me build traction with my audience in the beginning and now my audience grows more when I just write for my own newsletter so now I only syndicate I don't do guest posts for other people but I syndicate where do I syndicate I syndicate on HuffPo Inc the next web and sometimes I know I'm, well I put my article on medium so early syndication and then the articles sometimes show up on like muse or couple other places life hacker sometimes but those are the main ones like uh huffpo inc and um the next web now some people i know get really freaked out by like duplicate content and google and seo and all that but does that not matter so much when there are those big like established sites nope okay. makes zero lick of a difference and that's why everybody's like oh i don't want to post on medium because it'll kill my seo it doesn't awesome like every seo person that i've talked to is like google can tell if you're putting your stuff on shitty websites. Yeah. Like it knows. It may rank your medium post or your HuffPo post higher than your own site. So if you care about that, then maybe that's a reason to maybe put it on your site first and then a week later put it elsewhere, but I don't care. All all the sites that I post my articles on my my own site included all link back to my newsletter, which is the only thing I care about. So I don't care what shows up higher in Google. Like if somebody reads the article on Inc versus my site, I don't care. It doesn't matter. It all links to my newsletter. So it's all good. I love that because you're not just talking about driving traffic to your blog. Because that's what mm -hmm. I feel like most people are like, oh, I want to get traffic from here back to my blog. But you're talking about syndicating and then driving that traffic to your newsletter, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, then it doesn't matter anyway, because if you're not if you're not like the primary focus is not driving that like page view traffic to your actual blog. You know, that does make a difference whether you're like, I know a lot of people who are truncating like an RSS or some kind of like shortened post, like you were saying, like, here's my email, read the rest on my blog. And to me, like, I, they, I'd be shocked. I mean, people don't share these kinds of numbers often. So I don't want to be like, so how many people actually clicked through 0.08%? You know, people don't click through, though, you know, very yeah. often. And so I feel like you're you're choosing page views over readers. Like I would rather have a reader. I don't care where they're reading exactly. than a page view. So, and those people are already on your mailing list. So I don't care if they go to my website or not. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all because they're already getting my articles in their inbox, which is what I want anyways. So I don't care if they go to my site. I want people to go to my site or the other sites if they're not on my mailing list. 
But for my own readers, I don't want to punish them and make them have to, <laughs> like, it's like a hostage situation. I don't want to have to take them to a second location. Oprah said that was bad one time. <laughs> It's like the best thing It was probably thing I've ever for heard. something ridiculously awful. Like it was probably some horrible, horrible situation that I'm making light of now. But I don't want to. I don't want to hold my readers hostage and take them to a second location. I want them to get the information that they want immediately. Yeah. Well, okay. Oprah said. Oprah said. O- Oprah said. Oprah said it. I'm not a huge Oprah fan, but I'll take this because I love. Me this. neither. She but I, re- for some reason, that's like the one thing I remember about Oprah. Well, if that's like the one thing, I feel like that's a really good takeaway. The question then becomes because I-, I feel like. For a lot of the people that might be listening to this who are big time, you know, I have a lot of listeners who are writers, but then also listeners who are big time bloggers. And it's like page views, page views, page views, because they're making money on their blog. So this I feel like I can Mm -hmm. hear the brains exploding, like because you're saying you don't care if they go to your website. So it comes down to revenue model, right? So if you are selling ads on your site, you need page views to make money. I don't sell ads on my site. I sell products and the place that I sell the most products is my mailing list. So I weight that, like that's the only KPI I care about. Like page views, doesn't people on my site, unique visits, clicks, bounce rates, don't give a shit. Yeah. Because all of my revenue is generated through my mailing list because all of my revenue relates to products, not to ads. So it's a very different sales model. It's a yeah. very different revenue model. If somebody's selling ads, then hell yeah, <laughs> you need a whole lot of page views. Or you need, if you're selling ads in your newsletter, then you need opens and clicks. Or you need to hope that the advertiser isn't savvy enough to ask you for those numbers and they just care about the vanity metric of how many people are on your list. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's it's more um, like different revenue models r- require different KPIs. Yeah. So, and I think for me, I think I've been moving more away from that, the the model of making the money through like the ad revenue, because I, I think it's, to me, it seems broken and it seems like it's only getting more broken. Like I think because the blogging space is so crowded, it's harder and harder. And like those, those things are dropping. Like when I first started blogging, I was on a uh, blogger, you know, like Blogspot, and I had a blog my mom read, and I got on Blog Her, the the network yeah. right away because someone mentioned this to me. It was just starting, and I would get like a thirty to forty dollar check a month, and I don't, I don't, you know, I did not ever once check. I don't know how many people are reading my blog. I have no idea how many page views I got. I don't think I knew how to even check that, you know, but I was still getting like this tiny check, which was like, cool, I'm just writing stuff, and people are, are giving me, yeah, that's great. Well, then I actually started growing. And then the checks went down and I was like, well, that makes zero sense. But what happened was the blog, her network got big. And so then they were paying less. So I was actually finally like, I was like, cool, I'm going to make more money because I have more people reading, but that's not what happened. And so for me, like, you know, that was years ago and I've been, you know, not using them forever. I've been doing sponsored posts and different things. And, and I'm kind of stopping all that. Like I've tried a lot of the different revenue streams and for me, those don't work very well. But as I've tried them, I've seen them, I I feel like, you know, everything's always changing online. But I feel like that, that model is becoming less and less effective. You know, we have like ad blindness and sidebar blindness, like people don't, you know, see those things anymore. So yeah. And if you're just charging, or if you're just getting paid for CPMs or something like that, it's a race to the bottom, because that the, the number you make just keeps going down. So the only way that I see advertising working really well is when it's more of a cost per influence. Hmm. So when you are the authority in your market or niche and you charge advertisers based on your authority instead of just like, well, the industry rate, or like yeah. for podcasts say, the industry rate is like $18 per CPM. But because I'm authority in the space, I'm going to charge $100. And then if I have like 10,000 um, downloads per episode on average, then I get $1,000 instead of like, I don't know what the other number was, was, my math is shit, but like 80 bucks or something like that. So when you're able to charge for the authority and influence that you have in your industry, then ads make a whole lot more sense than just the race to the bottom of, I'm just getting paid for straight up like downloads or clicks or that sort of thing. Yeah. Because it's hard to make it's hard to make money because ads keep getting more and more devalued. Well, and for me, you know, I, I think the light bulb kind of went off. You know, as I realize what I'm good at, also, which is, you know, I like content creation, and so like to me, mm-hmm. that's turning towards like products and things. But the light bulb went off for me this summer when I um, or this fall, I guess, I have another site, you know, that this podcast runs through. I have a lifestyle blog, and that one has all the page views. You know, that's my big traffic place. But I started this new site where the podcast lives and that has like so little traffic. But 
I sold a course out of that and I made money on that. You know, like the, the most money I made came not from the blog with all the page views, but from the site where I'm selling a course that has no page views. And so to me, that was kind of like, okay, it's not, it's not, you know, for me, I like the model of not worrying about the size. Like clearly I want people to come. I want more people to be coming mm -hmm. and reading because I like my content. But I also, I hate that feeling of like, for my lifestyle blog, Pinterest changed its algorithm this summer and my yeah. page views got cut in half. I changed, you know, nothing um, about how... Well, because you're playing in somebody else's playground yep. and they changed the rules. They took their bouncy ball and went They home. did. They took their bouncy ball <laughs> and I was left like sitting on, you know, the four square court wondering what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so that does affect all those things and that makes me, you know, gets me all sweaty and I'm like, I don't want to worry about that. I want to go on, you know, vacation. I want to go on vacation and not worry about updating my blog. I don't want to feel tied to this. And when you're, for me, and this may not be for everybody, for me, when it's about page views, then you are tied. Like I'm so, my, I'm mentally tied. I'm emotionally tied to what's happening yeah. on there. And I've got to produce more and I've got to promote more. And I've got to, you know, it's like this hustle, not the good kind of hustle. I love hustling. I'm all for the hustle, but not for like that kind where I feel like I'm chasing, you know, something that's not mine and something that's not lasting. Cause then, you know, the other thing, you know, all, if your traffic comes from Pinterest, generally your bounce rate's crazy high because they yeah. click through and then leave, you know, and, and so I'm not gaining readers from that. I'm just getting page views. So I, I like the idea of like thinking about the metrics and it will look different for everybody. And and the thing about lists too, like, again, it's not a one size fits all for your list or, you know, your, your blog, whatever you're doing, it, it, it depends totally on your goals and what you're pre what, what you're able to produce. Cause a lot of people are not, going to make their own products, you know, so then they have to like, if they want to make money, look at a different kind of model for that. Yeah. And I'm, I've always been more interested in disruptive revenue streams anyways, like for the podcast that I host with Jason, we decided we had for season two of that podcast, we decided instead of having sponsors, which we could have made a, a considerable amount of money on, we decided to sell a bundle of our own products. And that ended up generating more revenue than any advertiser would ever pay us, especially because we do things like talk about who would win in a fight, like zombies and vampires. Like there are some business podcast episodes, but there's also just like us being stupid because we are stupid and it's fun. So there's ways to disrupt revenue models that aren't just like, oh, this is how the top blogger in the, the business does it. So I have to do it exactly the same way and base it on this. It's like you can kind of figure out new ways to do it and do it that way instead because it's it's interesting and people pay attention to that sort of stuff as well. But it's also, I don't know, for us, for that, it was like, well, why don't we just, like we have our own products, so why don't we just become our own sponsors of the show and then we just get to make money off of the things we know relate because we made them. Yeah. And then our audience benefits because they get the things we've made at a, a better deal than we would typically offer. Yeah, I love that. And I, I think... This idea for me, like whenever things start working really well for everybody is when they stop working, exactly. you know, and so, um, you know, I've gotten I've started doing like one or two like free kind of webinar training type whatever is a month, which is really fun. Like I just really like doing it, even if, you know, 20 people only show up like it's really fun. And, you know, I sold my course kind of through there and I don't use Facebook ads. I just kind of do it through some of the groups that I'm in. And that's super fun. Like, I love that. And I see all these people now, all of a sudden, there's like three that I can think of kind of this year, courses that came out on how to use webinars to like make money. And I'm like, oh, well, I better find something else because like, yeah, once all the people do that, and, and I sign up, like I, I do, I'm at least signed up for one webinar a week from somebody because I like learning. And so, you know, I, there are so many of them being done that I know that that's it's not broken yet, but it's breaking. Like it has to be because that's, it's way too common. Yeah, because it's reaching saturation where everybody's doing webinars all the time. So obviously they're going to be slightly less effective because everybody's Absolutely. doing them. It's just like courses, like courses, like when say like Marie Forleo's B-School came out, there weren't that many people making yeah. courses. And obviously it's, it's a great product and she has put so much time into making it and then so much time into making it better. But like launching a course now, even for me, like launching a course, my first course a couple of years ago and launching a course now, there's so much noise now that it takes much more work to stand out because everybody's doing courses on similar topics now. So it's, it's difficult when everybody sees like 
two or three of the top people like, oh, webinars generated like $100,000 a day for me. It's like, okay, well, and everybody's doing webinars now. So then nobody's making that because there's so much yep. noise. So I, that's why disruptive revenue models, that's, that's like figuring out how to do something that nobody else is doing. And then you can be the person saying like, I make $100,000 a day doing this like crazy shit. And then everybody follows you and then that, that becomes saturated. But you at least made the money at the yeah. onset for doing some crazy Well, okay, so what's thing. next? And let's figure this out. Tell me so I can like get a jump on the game. <laughs> oh, shit. I have no idea. I don't like I plan things like the day of typically. Oh, man. Okay. Not for launches. Like for launches, I plan a few months in advance. But yeah. for like weird and crazy ideas, like the podcast that I launched a few weeks ago, I thought like maybe I should start a podcast. 10 minutes later, I was producing the show. Love it. Another 10 minutes later, I was recording the show. And then another 10 minutes later, I had finished editing it and uploading it to iTunes. So I just kind of go go with things. Like I obviously do like launch strategy and plans and that for bigger things. But if I want to make something fun or if I want to do something, I'm just going to do it. Kind of, yeah, you're my kind of, kind of people. I love <laughs> I love that. I used to, even writing books, like I used to plan out like, okay, in six months, I'm going to have time to write my next book. It's going to be about this. And then six months would come around and be like, fuck, I'm not even interested in this anymore. Like, why did, why is this in my calendar to write this book? So now it's like, if I want to write a book, I just write a book. Like I start writing the book. <laughs> but there's a place for planning too. Like I, I definitely, I mean, clearly you're the guy who split tests your images <laughs> for your yeah, profile picture. Yeah, and I typically have like a four week lead up to product launches as well. Like I, I do plans some things but and as far as like making things I still like that because it's just like um because I come from a, a music background so it's like if you're recording a song in the studio that you've played live for two years it's hard to capture that excitement when you start yeah. recording because you played that song every night for two years but if you record a song that you wrote the night before then you're still so stoked on it you're still like the excitement like we think that we're masters at hiding our intentions and we're not like we all suck at it so if you are genuinely excited about the thing that you're doing or working on or releasing, then that's contagious. Like people see that come through, especially if you let that shine through. And so I think I always kind of try to leave room for that where I can be spontaneous and continue the excitement of something new and release it as soon as possible. Otherwise, yeah, it would, yeah, the excitement wouldn't be there for for everything. And sometimes the planning, like for me, I think... Um you know, you don't want to miss that window. So if, like mm-hmm. when I when I was thinking about webinars and doing that, because I, I really like teaching and I like talking to people and the live aspect was fun. And I was like, well, everybody's doing this. So like, I need to do it tomorrow. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna I mean, I've already kind of missed like this peak. But like, so far, it's mostly like the giant people doing it, like the little people like me are not doing it yet. And so once all the little people do it, then it's totally dead. So I'm like, I need to be the first one doing it. like, I need to go right now. And <laughs> And I did. And I was like, next week, webinar. I don't know how to do it. We're doing it next week. And I did. Yeah. And so, and it was really fun. And, you know, there were mistakes, mistakes were made and, and it wasn't a big deal. So, and now I feel really comfortable just being like, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do one tonight. And it's not that there's no planning, like the training will be good and free mm-hmm. anyway. So that's a lot of fun. Well, okay. So now that we've talked about courses, kind of like running their course and, you know, being useless, totally useless forever. Tell me about your course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my course is, um, well, the main course that I focus on is the creative class, and that's helping freelancers who are good at what they do get better at business, marketing, and sales. And this is actually one of those things, because typically when I launch something, I get bored of it quickly, not because it's shit, but just because I've been working on it for months before launch. But creative class is the first thing that I've launched where I'm still, like I launched it about a year ago now, and I'm still excited about it. And I'm still like adding new things like podcasts and different interviews. I added a community a little while ago. I added um, like free training to it a few months after launch. So I'm always finding new ways to make it the same, as I said, with mailing lists, interesting and valuable to myself and to my audience. And it continues to be rewarding because I keep getting new students that I talking to you and that I see them having success from the training. But also it's it's rewarding financially. Like it still makes money. It's a course that still makes money and it came out 12 months ago. And my best sales months were like six or seven months after I launched it. So it's interesting that if I keep at the same thing, then it can continue to be like financially and otherwise rewarding to me. Who is it for? Like who would you recommend take the creative class? 
designers, writers, and developers who do projects for clients um, on like a project by project or gig basis, and where they use the internet as their primary vehicle for um, marketing and and finding clients. Awesome. So I like that. It's a nice yeah. wide umbrella, but I think like if you fit under it, you know, like you hear that and you're like, exactly. I know where I belong. Well, and you have to like silly humor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, like now you've got a taste for Paul, and you know, like what you're going to get in there, which is great. And you know, maybe that's not your course, and that's fine. But maybe you're like, I need, I don't, I'm not any of those things, but I just want more of Paul. So we're going to just like. <laughs> you also have to like Lord of the Rings more than Harry Potter. That's also stipulation. It's in the sale, it's in the sales video. For the course that generates the bulk of my income, I still have things like you have to like, this course is for people who like Lord of the Rings more than Harry Potter. This course is not for villains or parents of super villains. Like I also don't wear shoes and socks in the video as well, which is what most people comment on. That's but. hilarious. I, I have the course and I don't think I ever saw this video. So now I like want to go it's on see the, it. It's on creativeclass.io. Like it's the first, it's the it's the sales video. It's not like in the course. It's okay, just on okay. the sales page for the course. Okay. Well, Paul, this was really fun. I feel like I could chat with you. Like I have so many more things I could ask and would love to discuss with you. But this is probably a sufficiently long period of your day <laughs> to get over to this. And I really thank you for taking the time to chat with me about this. Yeah, no problem. And October's almost over And the dark nights are closing in again Okay, so be honest with me. Did you start sweating a little bit when he talked about deleting 7,000 people off his list? Or about Jason Zook, who is his Invisible Office Hours co-host, deleting 25,000 emails from an email list? Oh my gosh! But I think the point is this, this is kind of what I walked away with for me. So here's my kind of takeaway. It really isn't about the numbers. Yes, the numbers matter. Yes, you can do more with more people. But what really matters is that engagement. And if you have an engaged list of people, you are going to have a community that is going to help carry you through whatever it is that you're doing. And I think that's really important. And also it makes me feel better about being kind of like a human being, you know, that having a list that's not numbers. It's a list of people. And so that's kind of what I walked away with. And I love the way that Paul kind of handles all this stuff. And I will say, you know, for this will look different. Like we talked about for people who are getting their revenue stream straight from their blog, straight from ads. I don't want to knock that at all, you know, and that's just a different revenue model than what Paul has set up. And then kind of, kind of what I'm moving towards as well is kind of moving away from that model where I am so dependent on page views because I don't like it. I feel controlled by the internet and I want to live more in real life and I want to be myself and I want to just see kind of what happens. And you know, it is easier to say some of these things like just be yourself when, when clearly Paul has a really large list, but the reality is that he took work and took time to build that. And I don't know how long he's been building his list. I didn't actually ask, but he's been doing web design and being kind of present in that world for like 20 years. So just realize it doesn't happen overnight and that, you know, as you're building your list, consider this is what I, I did a webinar last week and talked about this. I like to consider the people who talk about really fast track growth. You know, Natalie Lucier has the 30 day list building challenge and on video fruit, you can do the jumpstart your email list and they have some really actionable tips to grow your list more quickly. And there are a lot of courses out there as well. They're like, get, get this many people on your email list. I like those in the sense that they give me tools to try. And then like everything else, I run it through the filter of what makes sense for me and what kind of audience do I want to build. So coming out of this interview with Paul, I feel really encouraged. I feel like I want to be continuing to build a community and build a an audience of people who are there because they want to hear what I have to say. And I may not be saying anything that's truly unique, but I'm saying it through my own filter, which is something I talked about last week with Damian Farnworth. So anyway, I'd love to hear from you and hear what you thought about this interview with Paul Jarvis. So make sure you hit up his website, but only to sign up for his email list because that's where the point is. And that's the other thing I really loved about this is that the blog is not the focal point. The blog is a means to get people on his email list. And that's just a really backwards way of thinking for most of us who are bloggers or on that online space. So mind blown just a little bit. Got to think about these things and figure out what that means for how I'm going to be doing things in my life and with my list and with my blog and all that. So I'm still figuring that out. I feel like this has been my year of figuring things out. And so I've got a couple more months to do that. So let me figure it out, you guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I've really been enjoying these interviews. I'm really glad to be back after my summer of just disappearing. 
And I'm thankful for all of you guys for listening. I hope you head over to the show notes at createifwriting.com slash zero two zero. And also, if you're listening through iTunes, I would love it if you left a review. I know a bunch of you guys are listening out there. And those of you who have left reviews, they've been glowing. I so appreciate it. I'm just glad you're listening. But if you could do that, that'd be awesome. It doesn't take a lot of time. And I hope you go out and think about what you're going to do with your list. Thanks again for listening. And I hope you have an inspired week. Summer die.